Welcome to Live from the Garden. I'm Karina, creator of the Let Us Live Edible Garden Movement. Together we will tour backyard, farms, rooftops, and other inviting spaces, all with the hopes of inspiring you to get out and get growing. How you doing everybody? My name is Ryan Christoph, um, Virginia native, transplanted to the Bay Area, living in San Jose. Um, on social media, you can find me on Christoph's Garden. So it's K-R-I-S-T-O-F-F-S period garden. Um, but yeah, thankful to be here. What led you to uh, your gardening experience? Why did you start or did you have an experience? Um, well, it's kind of more of like an opportunity based thing. So when I moved to where I'm staying at now, um, there was a decrepit planter in the back that just hadn't been upkept. And so I kept looking at it and I love Pico de Gallo. So I, as I kept looking at it, you know, it's warm and it was summertime. I was like, the one thing that would make Pico de Gallo better is if I could make it fresh myself. Mm. And so that was kind of like the tip of the iceberg is like, all right, so let me at least be able to grow the ingredients to make it myself. So I started with tomatoes, jalapenos, and cilantro. And I was like, I'll stick with store-bought onions for now um, because that takes a long time to grow. And then from there, it just kind of grew, especially with the pandemic now. Um, it's given me a lot of time and kind of an outlet, I guess, in a therapy sense to kind of just keep putting more time into it and keep expanding it. So it's uh, went from the planter to essentially the entire backyard. Nice, nice. The entire backyard. What size was your first bed? Um, I think it's uh, an eight by 14, I think. Okay. That's, that's it's actually like size. what's behind me. Yeah. That's a good size. And so then you just build from that. Um, did you come from a family of growers? Were other people in your family um, growers? Uh, yeah. So on my mom's side, um, her mother, uh, you know, back in the day, they kind of had to, they were forced to grow their own food. Mm -hmm. So before the city regulations were changed, you know, she was jarring and canning her own stuff, had her own pigs, her own chicken coop. Um, and then, you know, once the regulations in the city changed, then she kind of had to let the, the chickens and the pigs go, but she still kind of had her own garden. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to go into my mom's basement today, like there's still jars of stuff that she, her mother preserved and her mother passed away a year before I was born. Um, so kind of going down into the basement, it's like a step back in the time to see the things that she used to do. So like, wow. there's like old wine in there. There's like jams, jellies, like preserved vegetables. Wow. Um, and then on my father's side, um, my grandmother, comes from sharecroppers so her parents were actually sharecroppers um in jackson north carolina small hole in the wall place um so when i used to go back for the family reunions there it was on the original farm that they never left so the the property that they were sharecropping on they stayed there their entire lives so like going back um i was actually you know forced to go get hey go get a watermelon from the field kind of thing or go yeah. catch these chickens and so it's like although it wasn't forcing me to necessarily grow things it was kind of just being implanted into my brain like mm -hmm. subconscious you know mm -hmm. um and then from there my grandmother always had a garden and then uh as a kid me and my siblings we worked at colonial williamsburg which is a living history museum in williamsburg virginia mm -hmm. um and so during that you're doing interpretations on what it was like for the enslaved population and teaching school groups and students and so part of that job responsibility includes um, actually, you know, showing what the day in the life was. So if there's like a garden in the back, if there's potatoes and stuff, you know, you're tending to the fields, you're either, you know, picking the worms off the tobacco, like everything. So it's, it's one of those things where early on, I was constantly reintroduced into it and whether it was my job or not, it was something that I was kind of forced to do in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of came natural when I could do it on my own leisurely time to just go from there. And so do you still, well, one question, is your mother still growing anything? Yeah, so she she was, she's big on flowers. Okay. Um, but now I've actually been helping her get her garden up and going again back in Virginia. Her growing season's a little bit different. 
Mm -hmm. um so i'm actually planning to go back there and help her get like her above ground planter and stuff like that um because she wants to because she's still at clean williamsburg she's still teaching history and everything and mm -hmm. so everything that she does is uh you know rooted in africa and wants to be back connected to the roots so her big thing is she wants a keyhole garden um so she can direct compost and also it makes it easier so she doesn't have to bend over all the time so i'm gonna go back uh once it warms up a little bit because they're still in the middle of winter um, mm -hmm. and help her get that set up and going too. Can, for those of us that may not know what keyhole um, gardening is, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the lamest terms, it's essentially, um, you're kind of making the most out of whatever the situation is. So it was started in areas where the soil wasn't the best, mm -hmm. but you could direct compost into an above ground bed um, and basically enrich your own soil. So whether you know starting from clay or whatever, but the also the advantage to it is that as you get older, things bending over makes it a lot harder. So the same way that we have like above ground planters now, it's kind of like the, in my opinion, it's kind of like where above ground planters started. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also gives you an outlet to directly compost into your soil. So any food scraps, it, it minimizes your waste and it makes it more full circle. So it's called a keyhole because normally, um, if you buy one that's like kind of a put together, like on its own, like a do-it-yourself thing, there's a path that you can kind of walk through into the center, kind of like a keyhole. And in the center is going to be where your compost is. And then everything around that is where your vegetables are going to be growing. But I mean, there's multiple variations to it. It just kind of all depends on which is these is. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with keyhole um, gardening, I would encourage you, if you're in a small space, one, if you're in a small space, and then two, if you are in a um, space where, as uh, Ryan mentioned, that your soil is terrible, you may want to consider keyhole gardening. It's really effective. And uh, to your point in going back in history, we made the most out of every situation that we had. Like either is like, you, you can't say I'm not growing or my family's not going to eat because I don't have the space. We, you had yep. to figure it out. And so thanks to uh, our forefathers, a lot of the things that we have advanced in technology and advanced in our growing techniques are, you know, thanks to, thanks to them, right? Yep. Our and ancestors you, were key and still are the key today. You know, it, every, nothing's original and everything you can always trace back and figure out where it first started. I guarantee you it's going to be in our roots. Absolutely, absolutely. And you kind of brushed over the uh, museum that you worked at again. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, just because it's Black History Month, and I think that it's somewhat important uh, that we talk about that, is mention the name of the place and kind of talk about what you did at that museum. Uh, so it's Colonial Williamsburg. It's in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's based in the pre-revolution pre-revolutionary war time frame. Um, so 1774 is basically where everything is kind of set. Um, yeah, so essentially what they've done is a plane flying over, sorry about that, um, is they found the original um, foundations to the buildings. Cause you know, Williamsburg, Virginia, a lot of people don't know Williamsburg and Jamestown is kind of where everything started in a sense. You know, where our ancestors first landed was Jamestown, Virginia in that same area and then you know, Winsburg population was 52% black back in 1774. Um, so uh, um, the museum essentially is, you can learn about, you know, our fathers of the Declaration of Independence, but most people are coming there. Most people in our past should be coming there actually to visit and learn about their ancestors and what their impact was, because a lot of that is oftentimes brushed over in history and, and whitewashed in a sense. Um, but yeah, so every day, my, me and my siblings all worked there. I got four brothers, two sisters. Um, and it was essentially just teaching school groups, um, visitors who wanted to come visit Williamsburg, whether they came to get an education in, um, on what they thought our history was and walked away with something more than what they were expecting to um, was kind of our goal um, to kind of change perspectives. And, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, but you need to know. And very, you, you very don't know well history, put. Doomed to repeat it, you know. Very well put. I agree with you. And speaking of um, history and going back in history, how, are you able to? How far back are you all able to trace your roots? My mom is big on that and has been tracing our roots back to slave plantations in Williamsburg, Virginia. Wow. 
So she's she like that's her thing. Every day she's been like, oh, I found this new person. I found this new person. Even back to finding our ancestors and the original first black church in the country. So like she's she's like on it. Like that's her her big thing, and she'll never let it go. Wow, that that is talking about passing something down to your children. Uh, you know, that's that's really valuable. That's yep. good. I I need to do better is something that I keep saying that I'm going to do and haven't haven't done, but it is what I will do this year. I'll spend more time uh, getting tracing back my roots as far as I can. So uh, that's my commitment. That's that's I, I'm hold y'all. I'm putting it out there publicly so I can be held accountable. I, I'll work on that. Um, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter about the past. It's a matter about what you do from today going forward, right? So absolutely, makes absolutely. each day better than the last. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, what? Speaking of going back and and community and knowing about where we come from and connections, what type of impact do you think growing your own food has had um, on your community or the people that are around you now? And then if you look back to when your mother or your grandmother were growing their own food, what type of impact did that have on their community? I think it was one of those things where looking back on, like starting with my mom, my grandmother, my grandmothers, it was kind of the centerpiece of the family because you know black families you either you're centered around a church and you're centered around your meals and those were the times where people were coming together so by the fact that you're taking your hands and showing acts of love by you know putting your hard earn your hard work and your labor into putting something onto the table it's kind of paying it forward in a sense um and so just looking back on like childhood memories you know whatever my mom was doing to put food on the table or when i would go to my grandmother's house and there was like, you know, cans of, of vinegar that she spiced herself from the stuff she grew in her backyard or things she brought back from her, her parents' house because my great grandmother was still alive uh, when I was growing up. So I wasn't actually able to meet her. Um, but like, it's one of those things where it kind of centers you and brings you back to like, I guess being grounded in a sense, because there's nothing more humbling than like getting your own hands dirty and growing things that for your own sustenance to put onto your own table. Mm -hmm. um, I think now is one of those things that what drives me is the fact that I'm able to, like my brother stays with me um, and introducing him and myself to things that we may not necessarily like to eat, but then by growing it in the backyard and tasting it when it hasn't been on transportation for like weeks or store and storage and actually seeing what things taste like fresh and like when they're actually organic and nothing else is being mixed into it, it has a completely different flavor. Like for blueberries, for example, like I hadn't had really good blueberries until I saw my brother like come into the backyard and pick berries fresh off the bush and just start eating them. And that's something like, I would ne I've never seen him eat a blueberry before. And this was the first time I was like, oh, he's like, no, nah, these are actually good. Tastes like candy. You know, it's one of those things like, it's a little, it's a little things that kind of bring you joy about it, of being healthier, knowing what's going into your body. And then it's also like, it's a way to provide for other people. Much so I'm like, yo, I may not say it, but I care about you because of X, Y, and Z, you know? And that's kind of how we grew up, whereas you showed people that you cared for them by the actions, not just lip service. So if this is somebody doing something for you, you're trying to make sure you're in the best position of making sure you're cared for, provided for, then you know that they're actually genuine in what they feel, you know? Absolutely. And I, I think, I do remember when I was a lot younger and my grandmother would always, and anytime you go to an elderly per person's house, they're trying to feed you. They were trying to feed you. They wanted to, you couldn't leave without a plate or a bag, a brown oh. bag or something, right? And and I brought that up. That brought back memories when you mentioned, um, I may not say I care, but I'm feeding you, so you know I care. And yep. oftentimes they did not have, they may not have the money. Uh, or the extra money to put something in your pocket or to buy you something, but they always made sure you were fed. You, yep. you always made sure you were roof fed. over your head and some food in your stomach. Right. So. That, I, what like what else do you need? Right. You just need to be able to keep warm. Yep. Um, all right. So I know everybody came to see your garden. Uh, let's start this tour. Tell us what we're looking at. And um, when did you start? What, what, how long ago did you start your garden? This, this will be my third 
I guess coming into my third spring at this place. Okay, third spring. Uh, um, all right, let me see. Let me take this off. All right, third spring. While he gets his camera turned around and situated, I want to welcome you all to Live from the Garden. I am your host, Karina, and we are live every Saturday at 2 p.m. Central Time. Hey, share this video with somebody you know, and also tag someone. Uh, who should we have on the show next? Who would you like to, whose garden would you like to tour? Whose backyard do you want to tour and see what they're growing? invite someone, tag them, share this, do us a favor and comment, 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 ask questions. That lets me know and that lets our guests know that you appreciate their time. And that lets me know that the content and the information that I am at, uh, questions that I'm asking and the information that we are sharing, that it's relevant to you. So engage with us, ask questions, uh, like, comment and share. All right, Ryan, let's go ahead and see what we're working with. All right, so right now you're looking at my bok choy. I've got about six plants, um, and I've had these in the ground for a few months now. You can kind of tell by their size. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been harvesting them using the cut and come again method, so I don't have to pull up the whole plant. How do you and prepare this that? How do you prepare bok choy? How are you eating that? Uh, I saw stir fry. Okay. Yeah, so um, I kind of, what I'll do is I'd look up recipes that I find or just think about like, all right, what's a creative way to do it? And then just try it. And so far, um, I've been liking it as like a stir fry as a nice crunch if you don't cook it too long. Um, and then, so this is the planter that I was telling you about, the, the larger one. Um, and I just kind of rotated the soil not too long ago um, to get some winter planting in there. And so you see down here, these are some Swiss chart seedlings. So this is gonna be the magenta one. I mean, not magenta, the golden Swiss chard. And then you have the ruby red. And then those are some green onions planted in between. Um, I've been trying to do companion planting. Um, okay. Since everything is organic, I've been trying to like find ways of intermixing uh, plants to help keep off pests so I can make my life a little bit easier. I don't know if you saw, but on the Swiss chard, there were some ladybugs still there that I kind of threw on there to help get rid of any aphids or anything that might be walking around. Okay, so did you go buy those or those just happened yeah. to be a gift to I you and, and flew? Yeah, I bought them. It's wintertime, so they're not around yet, but I try to find ways to attract them. Um, and these I just planted, which are some red Russian kale seedlings. So there's six of those there. And then I got bored. And so these are some radish seeds. So there's the, uh, the white icicle. French radish and then, I mean, breakfast radish and then the the regular red radish mixed in there. Have you tried Easter egg radishes? No, what is that? They're kind of longer and then they have the, have you tried watermelon radishes? I haven't, not yet. I've seen them. Um, Those are good. I have to try them. How do you prepare them or you just eat them raw? You just eat them raw like the regular radishes. And these are my bell pepper, the big birth of bell pepper plants. Um, this will be going into the third season of having them. And they, I just let them overwinter and it kind of trimmed everything back that was dead. And then this year, um, they kind of outgrew the cages and the stakes that I had. So I decided to use some old cucumber trellises and just tie them up that way and see if it works out better. I'm telling you, it's going to work out better because to fight, to get those to stay in a cage, I I, I started doing that last year is uh, kind of letting mine vine and trellis up and instead mm -hmm. of trying to cage them, I think it's, it's a better method. It's, it's It seems to be, for me, a lot easier. Um, Kira said, it is going to be so lush once everything matures. Yes, you're going to have plenty to grow, I mean, plenty to eat there. Um, and then on the back side, I uh, just got these in dirt because I, I rotated the soil here. And I noticed um, because the soil had been taken care of in the planter, a lot of it was kind of like a, a hard clay. You can kind of see like it's not really breaking up. Um, so I mixed that in with um, some compost I had as well as some chicken manure. And then I was able to get these into the dirt, which are cauliflower purple cauliflower 
and some Brussels sprouts. Mm, okay. So those are interplanted, even though, you know, they're impacted by the same pests, I figured I can stay on top of it. So I wasn't too concerned about that. And then this would be my spinach. And then here is my corner for my onions and garlic. Go back to the spinach. Those are, that's beautiful. Oh my goodness. Nice. What type of spinach variety is that? Uh, you know, I don't remember. Um, yeah, don't give me lying to you. I do not remember. And I didn't label it. Rookie mistake. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's not a rookie mistake. It's a mistake that we all make. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then here's a, a grow bag with, I've been switching over from plastic to grow bags. Um, just to be more environmentally friendly as well as it helps with drainage. And so I don't have to worry about things getting root bound. Um, but this is a bag of spring onions, which are a mix of seeds that I've sown and cuttings that I've regrown from the store. And then these onions are red onions, white and some walla walla. And those are a mix of seeds I planted myself and um, just regrowing onions from store cuttings too. <clears throat> and, and before you move on, on the store cutting, I do want, again, cause we're trying to inspire you all to get out and get growing. The onion cuttings, can you tell us how you do that and how simple that is? Yeah, so um, a lot of vegetables you can regrow from cuttings from the store. Um, the easiest way to do it from what I've found is if you have an onion, save about the last inch, inch and a half of it, the root in, leave that intact, and then sit that on like either the top of a cup or some container with water in the bottom just to cover the roots. And, and as long as you change the water a couple of days to make sure it's clean, eventually you'll see new root growth happening. And then as the new plants start to grow up, eventually you'll see where you can actually separate them and then plant and they'll become ready to be planted once the roots are strong enough. Yes, and I always like to talk about uh, using your scraps from kitchen during the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, where a lot of people are um, cutting, uh, you know, buying a lot of vegetables and those are those cut and come again kind of things that you can do. So like onions, you can do that with celery. You yep. can do that with, what else? Oh, pineapples as yep. well. Pineapples, uh -huh. onions, celery, um, lettuce. Mm -hmm. um, carrots, you can do it. But from what I've, from what I've read, because I haven't personally done it myself, is when you do it from carrots that they, they'll grow flowers, but they won't grow new carrots. So you can get seeds from it, but it's still like a way to save money if you didn't want to pay for seeds. Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't heard that. That's a great mm -hmm. idea. Um, and I think if for those that want to try it, anything that you buy from the store that has a root that may have been um, kind of cut off, you can, yep. do that. you can do that with sweet potatoes, uh, red potatoes, white potato, Irish potatoes, um, anything that has a root, celery, I mentioned that. What else are we thinking about? Radishes, um, yep. if you kind of leave the, the bottom. I, I don't know what else, but yeah. I, I think a lot of it in general is like with gardening. Um, I really don't say that there's failure. It's just lessons to be learned because not everything is going to go according to plan. And, you know, it's, it's nature. So it's going to do what it's going to do anyway. And all you can do is kind of help push it into the right direction. Right. So worst case scenario, just give it a shot. If it don't work or you don't like it, compost it. You don't have to do it again, but at least you know now, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so these are some of my soft neck garlic varieties in there. Um, those have been in ground, I think, for about six months. So they're almost ready. And then these just broke dirt this week, which is some more soft neck garlic. And are you buying the clothes from a supplier or this is from the store? Um, some are from the store. And then like Lowe's out here, I hadn't seen garlic cloves um, available. And then one day I went in there 
and they had a whole bin full. So I just took as much as I could. Okay. Um, but the ones that are in the dirt already that have been there for six months are ones that I sprouted from the store myself. So again, that is uh, yeah. something you can, turmeric, gin, ginger, I forgot about that. Turmeric, ginger, garlic, those are things that you can put um, in the ground and have some for your family. At least you know it's organic, you know it's nutrient dense because it, like you said earlier, it hadn't been trucked in or uh, yep. gassed up. Um, and so I got a couple bags of those and then these are some red onions that I just planted not too long ago like a couple of weeks ago. And these were seedlings that I actually got from the nursery. Mm. And then behind me, you have my aloe plant. And we've been getting a lot of rain. So that's why the tips are brown because it's been overwatered from nature. Um, it's got a couple rosemary bushes that I've been trying to get to bush more. This one you can see is kind of by me trimming it. It's become bushier. These are a little behind, but we're getting there. And then my mint, which is starting to grow back, kind of died back in the, in the winter. Um, this one still hasn't come back, but I can see little seedlings or I guess new shoots coming up. But I have spearmint, um, chocolate mint, peppermint, and sweet mint. Um, I wanted to mention um, on your rosemary, do you know that there are some varieties that uh, don't bush up? They kind of, kind of vine and crawl. So if you find that yours doesn't get bushy, it may be a different variety that's more of a climbing or a uh, one that's gonna spread out more and it's not gonna grow up in bush. Yeah, that, that'd be more the, uh, the ground cover varieties, right? Um, I don't know if it's called, it's not called ground cover. I, I can't like think of the family. name, but uh, it's still an edible rosemary, but it just doesn't bush up. So if you find that that one doesn't bush up, you may have that particular variety. Gotcha. And so here we got my lemongrass. And I see you cut that. Do you put it in tea? How do you use your lemongrass? I've made, I haven't put it in tea yet. I've seen like some recipes for tea, but I like caffeine. So I haven't made just like herbal teas, <laughs> um, but I've been using it in marinades and um, like Asian dishes or mm. dishes that call for it or my roommate, uh, he cooks as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Between, between me and him, it gets used for that. And then here's some Greek oregano. And these were actually um, in the, the bigger bed, the planter that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to make room for the actual, the winter vegetables. So I moved them into cloth pots. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite herbs, which is lemon thyme. Mm -hmm. So this one I just got from the nursery maybe a few months ago. This one is going into a second year, but the plant got sick. Um, I figured I wouldn't quit on it because it only had one branch that had leaves on it. And so you can see how the entire thing essentially died back, but it's growing back slowly. Okay. So I'm just kind of letting it do its thing. I, I do, and I'm always, I believe we can all, there's always lessons to be learned in gardening. Like you just said, it looked like it was dead. You almost gave up on it. Um, I, I would like to say to people, you know, often times we give up on something or someone and it looks like it's over our, on its last leg. But we, if we see things through and nurture things, sometimes we can help or bring someone back or help bring yep. a situation back. I like to always find ways to relate gardening to life. And I think if you yep. maintain your garden uh, like it is a living person, if you relate the same things, you'll find success. It's all energy and vibes, right? Like you, you reap what you sow in the garden and you reap what you sow in life. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where like nothing worth having comes easy. Yeah. So you put a little time, a little effort, patience, and just see things will persevere and you never know what comes out on the backside. Yep. Yep. Amen. <laughs> I mean, take you out of church, but um, <laughs> hey. so um, the pat the first couple of times I've grown peppers, they didn't make it through the winter because the winter was colder. This year was a little bit milder. So a lot of my peppers survived, although I still got some trimming to do. Um, 
here are some of the Tabasco peppers I got. So you can see that there's a lot of green ones, but they haven't matured yet. Some red ones at the top. And these are my Fresno peppers. And, and is this are, your first year on those plants or they are are they come second, back from second year so okay. they i had these last i got these last spring and so this will be their second season kind of growing but they they've kept peppers throughout the winter it's just taking them longer to mature and what do you do with your peppers um hot sauce uh, i also have a dehydrator so if it's not hot sauce or cooking with them fresh um, my roommates made wing sauce with them, mm. um, made sauces with them, uh, fresh fermented, like just kind of experiment. Cause it's all like a playground mm -hmm. to see kind of what, what variations taste best together, which ones are hotter. Like I've had Fresnos from the grocery store and even like, uh, my jalapenos. These are some small ones from like being overwintered again, but like even the ones that I've gotten from the grocery store, the heat profile is completely different on ones that come out the backyard. Like the flavor stronger as well as the heat, it's, they've tend to been on the hotter side. Uh, so these are a couple of my jalapeno plants and more of the Tabasco peppers. These are a little bit further, the ripening process. And then this is one of my ghost chili plants that has nothing on it, but you can kind of see as the season's changing, we're getting some new leaves getting generated. Mm -hmm. And here's another one. And so we have my strawberries and these are the quinault variety. And is this your first year or second year or third year on that? These are second year. Okay. But this year what I've been doing is I've been basically, I feel like I was hoarding everything, but saving like old plastic containers and then um, old uh, pots from like getting plants and stuff. I've been trying to save as many runners as possible. Oh just yeah. Just to see if I can like actually, because it's like you have, I have five plants, six plants, because I don't know how to count, but six plants here. But in order to get enough strawberries to do something with, you really need a lot of plants. Right. So I figured instead of going and buying them, let me see if I can just save the ones that have already been reliable and just go from there. Yeah, um, and if you could real those. quick, um, for those that are growing strawberries and you want to try to get more plants, can you show them that the root, how if you just put it in the ground, it'll take off? Yeah. Here's one actually right here. So <laughs> this is what a runner looks like. Plant sends out a new shoot. And then as long as you sit it on top of soil and keep the soil moist, uh, it'll take. And as you can see, this one it took because if I'm pulling on it, it's not coming up. Mm -hmm. But let me see if I can find. Might not have to. And so while, while you're looking for that, that the they sell at the store the thing where your strawberries just kind of hang over. Um, but that limits the amount of strawberries that you get if you kind of have them growing in the air. If you look, if you grow them lower to the ground and in a pot, then you can get your runners to grow in the soil and then start uh, producing more vines, more flowers, more fruit. So uh, you will limit the amount of strawberries you get if you get a hanging basket and they're not sitting directly in the soil. This was one, but it looks like it took inside the, the pot already. Okay. So I don't think I have one to show. That I think the other one that you showed at first, how it's coming out of the pot and, and that, that one right there. So yeah. all it is is that runner comes off and you kind of lay it in soil and the key is to keep it moist. And you have a whole nother pot that eventually you can cut that main, the main runner off and yep. you've got several other strawberries. And because I tugged on this one and it's not pulling out the dirt, it's actually ready to be cut now. Right. So I'll do that later. And then these are my favorite, which are my blueberry bushes, which are actually blooming right now. But I have three different varieties. 
So these two are the same, which are, they're kind of a dwarf species, but they, they get berries in June and July. And this variety is, I think it's June, July, and August is when you'll get fruit. But for some reason, this year, because it's been milder, they're mm -hmm. blooming way earlier than they had before. And so this is going into my third year with these. And then this is the newest one. This will be my second year with this one. That's the pink lemonade. Ooh, how so, are those? I like them. Um, it's a, it doesn't taste like a blueberry. It's kind of, um, it's not tart, but it's kind of mild in sweetness, but it's kind of like if you were to drink like pink lemonade, like the flavor where it's, it's not super sweet, but it's like a nice subtle sweetness. It's kind of like that oh, with wow. the hint of blueberry. Um, and then we have my snap peas. And so I was being lazy and I decided that since the house came with this fence in the middle of it to kind of keep the dogs in the back, that I'd use the fence as a trellis. That's that, I think that's called engineering. I don't know if that's called lazy. I was trying to save myself some work. So I figured this is the easiest route to go. Um, but I got those, those there and then a couple more over there. And then as they grow and I've just been weaving them in between the fence trying to force them to, for the tendrils to catch on. Mm -hmm. This is a planter that I built from an old shipping container that I threw, you know, some wheels on and a couple pieces of wood so I can move it around. Um, but this is mammoth garlic. Oh, wow. And this is the planter that I put together yesterday that I think I'm going to put some Swiss chard in. But it's a self-watering one. It makes life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Here's one of my two compost bins. And it's a vermicompost, so there should be some worms in here somewhere. But I don't know if y'all want to see them. Yeah. yeah, we want to see them. So there's one. And one thing about compost, you all, if your ratio is right and it's mixed right, compost does not stink. So don't be afraid to compost. Compost does not stink. It should not stink if you have- It actually doesn't. Right. It should not stink if you have the right ratio. If you have too much food then, uh, or it's too wet, it will start stinking. And then, so here is kind of the black gold coming out the bottom as they work through it. You see there's some worms in there too, but- this is kind of where I get most of my compost from. I have another smaller one too, but here's some chamomile that I still haven't used yet. Hmm. We're growing that too, but I haven't. This is my first year growing it in our garden. Um, and then my cilantro has flowered or started to. It's pretty big. Kind of see the height of it. Is this your first year letting that go to seed? Second time. What did you do with the seeds? I uh, just planted them. Did you know I've, that uh, those seeds are coriander? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you let them go to seed, then you can grind grind them and make your have your own coriander powder, and then use some to uh, plant the following uh, season. So what I did, I haven't ground them up because I had some ground coriander already in the cabinet that I was trying to get rid of first, mm -hmm. but I used them to plant and then I also use them in a pickling spice. Mm. So and then here are my Meyer lemon trees. Got some fruit on this one. And I got a couple that are ready. Is this your, how, how long have you had that, those trees? This is going to be year two. Wow. Um, and I got them, I think they were two years old when I bought them. Then here's some of my romaine and bib lettuce that's uh, started to flower or mm -hmm. bolted, however you want to call it. But I got a good use out of it. 
but you know, got red romaine, some bib lettuce, and some regular romaine that I'm gonna save those seeds from. And here's a couple of my eggplant plants that overwintered. Some artichokes. And then. Have you gotten artichoke from your artichoke plants? No, not yet. It's, it's, it's definitely been testing my patience. <laughs> hey, but don't give up. This will be, I have a client that we just installed some artichokes for. So I, I have not grown them myself. So I'd, I'd be interested to see how it turns out. I don't even like artichokes, but I figured if I grew them myself, I might find a way to like them. Yeah, true. Um, and then here's my broccoli, the more mature ones anyway. Um, and I've already harvested the main stalk. So now I'm just waiting for these side ones to grow. As you can see, got little heads forming. The, what, at, what they sell at the store called broccolini, Willie, is just broccoli shoots, you all. <laughs> and you can kind of see the ladybugs I threw on there. Mm -hmm. um, these are the Brussels sprouts. They're a little bit way, well, not a little bit, but way ahead of the other ones that I just showed you earlier. Here's my next planting of broccoli. Those are garlic chives. And then my cabbage. And so this is actually what made me get the ladybugs is because um, one of the things I learned especially throughout this process because it's constant like education on how things are going is your plants will let you know if something's wrong. And so I was looking at some of my cabbage and noticed how it wasn't forming heads and saw that these were kind of shriveled up and curled, which is a sign that it probably has a problem. And as you can see, there's some aphids right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that they do their job and get rid of those. Um, same thing over here. So it's two of them that looked like they was having a problem. So I just went and put ladybugs on all of them to let them do what they got to do. But some of them are in a good spot. So I'm starting to get some heads forming. The out, I love to eat the outside of the cabbage leaves more than I do the head of lettuce. They really? Taste, yes, they're far more delicious than the head of lettuce, I think, because the head of lettuce, um, excuse me, the head of... Uh, the cabbage is more whiter, you know, as you get the head, it's white and the outside leaves are a darker green. They kind of um, put you in the mind of a collard. So if you like collard greens, you may like gotcha. the outside of the cabbage leaves. And I actually cook my cabbage leaves with my collard greens. I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah, let us know how it tastes. All right, and this has been my quarantine project, which is the greenhouse. That was kind of like I built it, I bought it, and then just put it together myself. And then, so here are all the strawberry runners that I've saved. And like I said, I've basically just been saving anything. So this is like an old sauce container. Of course, make sure there's holes in the bottom. But did it so far? A lot of them died, but you know, you keep saving them. Eventually, some of them will take and save, and keep going. So. I throw those. Here's some for your seeds. strawberry runners. The other one of the things you can think about doing is you know the uh, paper, not paper, the brown egg cartons that are made of, I guess, basically crepe paper. Or, uh, paper. Yeah. You can use those because you can put them directly in the in ground, the and over time they just um, uh, disintegrate. You know, um, they so you could use those. I often, I sometimes I use the the paper, I guess, what is it called? Crepe paper? Or the this brown. Is, it's pressed cardboard, right? Yeah, like, like cardboard. That. Yeah, those, that egg carton, you can use those because you can water them and you can set them in the ground or next to a bed and over time they'll um, disintegrate and you'll, um, or compost uh, and you'll have, you don't have to move them or anything. So here are some other seedlings that were late germinating. Um, those are collards. I planted them way earlier than what they're actually growing for, but you know, they took their time. Uh, these are a couple San Marzano shoots, San Marzano tomato shoots. 
Here's another one, some more cilantro. And then these are the pepper seedlings from my grandmother's seeds that I saved. Um, when she passed in 2016, after her funeral, I went to her pantry and grabbed a bag of her dry peppers. Wow. So this, and this year I was like, all right, well, they say seeds will last for up to like four years, sometimes longer than that. So I figured why not give it a shot and see if they'll germinate. And so I actually got 12 of them. Well, more actually, because- oh, Wow, it that is so cool. So these are the peppers that she brought with her from North Carolina, from her mother's house. And yeah, so these were the ones that she used to always make like her spiced vinegar when she cooked her greens or whatever, it was like always available. Or if you needed something, you could go in a garage and get some out the wheelbarrow. Um, some cilantro seedlings, basil. So I got Genovese sweet and then the dark purple opal in the middle. I uh, got Beautiful. this kohlrabi, purple kohlrabi. And then this is technically a winter squash variety, but it's growing slow. Um, and I saw the seeds in the nursery, so I figured I'd try it, but it's the Lakota squash, which is supposed to be sweeter than the butternut squash. Mm. Um, and you know, Lakota Sioux Indians, it's kind of the squash that they said that they were growing. So I figured why not try something new. And then some of my tomato seedlings. So I have right now, I only have San Marzano and black creme. Nice. And then, so, you know, when you're planting seeds and they tell you do two to three in each hole to make sure, you know, increase your chances of germination. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the fortunate pleasure of every seed I planted germinated for the Swiss chard. Mm -hmm. which is why I have so many seedlings. I just, instead of getting rid of, them, rid of them, I just separate them and put them in their own little pot. So it's the golden one, ruby red, magenta. And there's like, I think it's the orange, like sunrise, I think is what it's called. Right here. And then, so I have some dill up here, mm -hmm. a few more cilantro, more red Russian kale, and a few more so start seedlings. And then I have flat leaf, parsley, curly parsley, uh, tarragon, pineapple sage. Oh, wow. And then we have some curly kale and then my Swiss chard. And so how do you prepare Swiss chard? How do, how do you use your Swiss chard? I saute it. I mean, I kind of keep it simple with like some onions, some peppers, maybe garlic. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, do the stems first cause they take longer to get tender and then throw the leaves in on top. Mm. And it's pretty straightforward, easy to do. And, and this is and, your, you said that, uh, your greenhouse, you just put that up during, um, quarantine. Yep. It, it started as I wanted to find a way to be able to, um, overwinter my tomatoes. And then because hot peppers, like this is one of my scorpion plants that's overwintering, um, they take so long to grow. You know, the hotter the pepper, the slower it grows. Mm -hmm. So by the time some of them started maturing, the season was changing. And I was trying to find a way to extend the season. And so that's where I got the idea to put a greenhouse back here. But then it, it also helps because it helps keep things off of the plants. Right. And the last thing I got is the only flowers that I grow. And these are, they just bloomed some more today. Are those snapdragons? What are those? Yeah, snapdragons. So I got about five pots of them to help attract pollinators. And so do you keep them on one end of your garden or do you intersperse them throughout your garden? Intersperse, so there's two big pots over here and then there's two pots on the other side. Okay. And then um, I got some seeds that I was gonna plant for getting more snapdragons for once the season's changing. 
Okay, yeah. so before you leave that area, give us a wide view. Before you leave that area, let's see a wide view. Because, And then I want to ask you, oh man, wow, that's beautiful. How much time on average per day do you spend? Oh, wow. You spend in your garden. Um, try to get up a few hours earlier and do it like, you know, three, four hours before work. And then right now the sun's setting, it's really based off the sun. So the sun's setting at, I think it's 543 right now around there. So um, I'll get up in the morning and do it. And then we'll try and take a break from my work to at least get the last couple hours of sunlight, depending on what I need to get done. Because it's kind of like racing against the clock. And it's one of, one of the best things about it is no matter what you do, the work isn't going to go anywhere. So you can procrastinate and put it off, but you legit reap what you sow. So if you like miss a day, especially when it's like hot out here and it's missing on a watering schedule, because I water everything by hand. I don't have um, any self irrigation, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother situation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just kind of puts importance on like, even if it's a little, you kind of got to constantly keep working at it or else you'll find out when something goes wrong. And for, you know, our show is to, our goal is to inspire people to get out and get growing their own food. If you are in the San Jose area, what would you say for a new grower is the best time for them to get started? Now, what season? Um, well, I, to me, I think if you want to start gardening, the best thing to do is to start with things that you like to eat. So depending on what you like to eat, like if you're, I love tomatoes and I love pico. So like for me, the summer was the season I cared about. This is actually my first time growing anything during the winter. Yeah. So I didn't really care about leafy greens and stuff like that at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say our winter, our frost period is super short and our winters tend to be super mild. Like the coldest will probably get out here is 32 degrees. Um, and doesn't stay that way for long. Maybe got like two months of that, of it dropping down. Um, so I would say like early, late winter, early spring, is probably the best time because you can start, you know, planting tomato seeds now. Um, you can start planting pepper seeds, you know, your summer squashes, like all that stuff. If you if you like that kind of food, then it's, the time is now. And it just really depends on what your palate is or what you're willing to try. Right, uh, that is, a very good point. I, I uh, hadn't put it like that. I do like the idea of figuring out what you like to grow and then grow in that season. I think that makes sense. I always say, um, if you want to grow, if, if you want to know where to start, definitely you need to look at your grocery bill or look at what your family eats and start growing from that. And then to your point, I, we need to add, uh, that's the season that you need to start growing. So that makes a lot of sense. And so when you're not gardening, what do you like to do? What do you like to spend your time? Because it looks like you got to spend, you, you got to spend all your time in the garden. Uh, oh, along that point, I get to your question. Um, I actually, what made me want to garden the most though, is you spend, looking at the grocery bill, you spend the most money on herbs. Like any type of herb that you're using in your food, you're probably only using it to make one dish and you got to pay between three and five bucks for that small pack that, that's it. Once you once you buy it, open it, like you, it's a limited time shelf and then it's done. Um, and oftentimes, unless you get like the basil or stuff that still has the uh, the stem attached, you can't you can't say that. But if it does, you can. Um, so I think growing herbs like rosemary, oregano, thyme, basil, um, things like that kind of help cut down on costs more than vegetables will. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to vegetables, it was what are the things that you have to pay by the pound? Right. So tomatoes are super expensive by the pound. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes the tomatoes you get from the store don't really have great flavor. They're bruised, they're not all the way ripe. And then the time for you to get them to the right ripeness is already too late because the best tomato is gonna be picked at its peak ripeness from the vine itself. Um, so that's where like tomatoes and herbs are kind of like been the key. And then grocery stores are boring. So you can't really get a, a vast variety of different peppers unless you go to like ethnic grocery stores, like I can go get different peppers that I can't get from a big chain restaurant, a big chain grocery store from like 
the Mexican grocery store up the street, or I can go to like the Asian supermarket and get something different. But those are still being cost at a like charged at a premium as well. Um, but to answer your question, when I'm not gardening to fill my time, um, I'm big on music. So I've been starting my own vinyl collection. Me and my brother actually make music. Um, video games, of course, I like the game. Um, reading and then outside of that, it's really just work. And then getting out in nature, I love hiking. So like hiking is like my big thing. And what type of music do you like to listen to? Everything, but my favorite, my favorite genre is funk. Old school, Parliament, Funkadelic, you know, give me the, the soul singers. Like I go back uh, into the back, you know, um, BB King. Oh, wow. Oh, it's like, I love old school. That's where the real music started from. I would agree. I would agree. I would agree. Um, and then if you could visit any green space, where would you like to visit? Any outdoor or garden or farm, a farm, where would you like to visit? Any farm? Green space. It doesn't have to be a farm. If you could go anywhere in the world, like have you seen a garden or um, even a hiking trail, some or something outside? Where uh, would you know? Actually, you know what garden spot I would love to visit is Ron Finley's Oasis. Oh yeah. Well, he's not that far. Have you been out there? How far is no. that for you? Uh, he L.A. I guess I'm not sure. I guess he's in L.A. LA. Um, that's about a six hour drive, hour flight. Yeah. Um, but just from following like what he's posting, like it looks like you just walk in and you're immersed into a jungle, but it's like a completely edible jungle. Yeah. So it's like, I think it's things like that to see like how you're doing the same thing, but everybody does the same thing in different ways. So it doesn't make it the same. Yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah I think that'd probably be the one that I had to check off. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, Ron Finley, you all, he's considered the gangster gardener. Um, I think he kind of paved the way for many of us. He's been at it for a very, very long time. Uh, so he's he's doing some amazing things. Uh, yeah, I would like to go visit his spot too because I think he has like this, he has a big pool that doesn't have any water in it. And they started like growing some things around there. And because he is a fashion designer originally he, he was a fashion I don't know if people know that originally he was a fashion designer and so that's why you see you didn't know that yeah he's a fashion designer uh, for a number of celebrities and so that's why you see all that art and color intertwined in his garden and I think he just recently put something out about being a designer or yeah, I think he has something that just recently came out about talking about his fashion designs or where he gets his creativity from or his process. So yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, this was fantastic. You have a lot of stuff. Wh where do you, do, do you try to share that in your food? Do you, do you have neighbors that come knock on your door and say, yo, I need a, a pepper? There's actually a couple people in the neighborhood who actually have gardens in the front of their yard. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've been trying to do, especially since things have been closed down, is when everybody was shut in and I had a lot of surplus, um, I would just, you know, get like a brown bag and fill it up, ask people like, yo, what do you like to eat kind of thing? Or what spices would you want to have? And just fill up a brown bag and just drop it off at the door of like, hey, just so you know, somebody's thinking of you kind of thing. Like, here you go. Um, just because like you got all of it, there's, unless you're saving it or using it for something, might as well like give it out to people, let somebody do something with it. You know? Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, that I love that idea. I um, took out my shrubs in the front yard and made it a edible garden. So I let my neighbors come harvest at will. I don't really harvest and take it to them, but I do take some surplus from our farm over to different organizations and people. So that's, that's really awesome. cool. Um, thank you, Ryan, so much. Uh, this was amazing. You have, I hopefully, you've inspired me to get my stuff together in my little uh, jungle. Uh, I hope he's inspired you all to get out and get growing. Tell us where we can find you. Tell us your social media platforms or tell us oh, what, yeah. how we can support you. Everything that I do is on uh, Instagram and then TikTok by the same name, which is Christoph's Garden. So Christoph, second half of my first name, K-R-I-S-T-O-F-F-S dot garden. 
Um, that's on Instagram and TikTok. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Thank you for watching. If you found this episode inspiring, please tell others about the Let Us Live Edible Garden series.